so, Roger, we're going to go back 40, 42 years in time, and you're not going to be watching the original trailer that the audiences around the world first saw and heard. Luke Skywalker and Han Solo rescued the princess, destroyed the Death Star, but their story didn't end there. <laughs> Creators of the biggest smash hit of all time bring you the next episode in the Star Wars saga, The Empire Strikes Back. The continuing story of our band of heroes, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo, C-3PO, R2-D2, and Chewbacca. And introducing Lando Calrissian. It's an epic of romance. Of heroes and villains. They cross trackless voids to unknown worlds. Galactic Odyssey against oppression. A big, new, sprawling space adventure in the Star Wars saga, The Empire Strikes Back. Coming to your galaxy, next summer. Wow, now this is how <laughs> you cut a trailer. We're going to come back to it in a moment, but um, this is going to be an interesting one. You know, for me, the best sequel ever, the best love Star Wars movie ever. Um, I mean, let me show you very quickly for those of you watching videos. This is my kind of custard for my my glass of water, you know, the Darth Vader mask <laughs> and so on. I mean, you and I love Star Wars so much, and this has been on the, the list of film marketing um, kind of uh, movies to review for such a long time. How important is The Empire Strikes Back to you? I've got so many strong memories of going to see Empire Strikes Back. Probably stronger memories of going to see Empire than I have of the original Star Wars movie. Possibly because it did create a bit of debate within our family. I don't think my, my dad particularly enjoyed it as much as Star Wars. He f certainly didn't enjoy the darker feel to it. Me, I was just absolutely blown away by it. I mean, for me, there was more action than the original film. The special effects were bigger. You know, those at-at walkers were just ludicrous, weren't they? I mean, so big and so massive and so powerful and yet so ludicrous if you think that they were actually based upon elephants, I guess. And that, well, they've got legs, so all you need to do is to get the legs to tip over. And I remember as well being disappointed that Leia started getting feelings for Han. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, no, it, Leia should be getting together with Luke. That's the way it's got to be. And of course, of course, I didn't know, like nobody knew at the time that Luke and Leia were actually brother and sister, which would have which would have put a really, really dark uh, um, cloud over that sort of direction. But at the time, I'm thinking, no, I can't handle this. I don't want Han Solo and Luke to get together. Together. And if you notice in the trailer, there was actually in the trailer a mm. deleted scene of Luke going in for a kiss with Leia. So I must have sort of subconsciously remembered that from the trailer and then sort of got disappointed when I saw it. And of course, how could we ever forget that sort of life changing, defining moment where Darth Vader makes that big reveal, Luke, I am your father. I mean, my goodness could there ever be a cinematic moment better than that yeah no absolutely you, you're right you know we, we have more uh 
planets, you know, you've got Hoth, you've got Dagobah system, you've got Bespin, you know, you've got all this. The music by John Williams is even better. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still, to this day, I mean, I'm picture and were perfect like you on Empire Strikes Back, I still get so excited when, you know, the, um, the, they've got a chase in the asteroid belt. And mm -hmm. and what they've done as well in, in this movie, directed by Evan Kushner, written with George Lucas and, and his um, and his colleagues, there's surprises after surprises. I mean, literally, you're taken to a world that you know you don't know and understand. And as we'll discuss in a moment, historically and even after this, actually, when you hear the word sequel, you kind of go, "Oh, here we go again." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be a rehash. It's going to be poorer. They're going to have less time, less money, uh, less talent. And if anything, they, they had more talent. The, you know, the special effects. You're right. The the soundscape as well. And this is Jeopardy. And of course, it finishes on a cliffhanger, mm. Um, mm. which also had people debating between critics and so on. Um, I mean, literally, we, we could do a whole uh, show and we should invite maybe our friends from Spark Rebellion and Sequel uh, Pitch, you know, to talk about Empire uh, to, to the point where whenever a uh, movie magazine or film festival do a kind of survey and poll, Empire always ends up on the top five, if not the top one, of this is the best film when it comes to cinema. Yeah, I think what people have got to really understand is how big a deal Empire was when it came out. I think if you actually look at the environment that it, of Hollywood in that time, just before the night before the eighties started. It was struggling, wasn't it? You know, television was becoming, you know, we, we'd have had a, a couple of decades of colour TV. Hollywood was struggling. There'd been some big films like Jaws, but when Star Wars came along, it sort of started to redefine Hollywood to a certain extent. But Star Wars was still a film on its own. It stood alone. And at the time, at the time... As you've said, sequels tended to be total rehashes of the original. You know, even down to the fact that the story would be exactly the same. Yeah, they that's may, right. Yeah, they, yeah. they may just change a few characters. They may change a few few locations. But if you look like something, look at something like Smokey and the Bandit, and compare it to Smokey and the Bandit Two, it's exactly the same film. Just a few different cars, a few different characters. And another one that comes to mind is the Clint Eastwood um, series, Every Which Way. Every Which Way But Loose, Every Which Way You Can. Almost exactly the same film. And, you know, Empire almost didn't go ahead because the bigwigs in Hollywood said to George Lucas, a sequel will be less good than the original and we don't want anything to tarnish the original's uh, you know, gravitas. So they almost didn't make it because they didn't think they could make a sequel that was better than the original. And of course, we're lucky that um, look, George Lucas stuck to his guns and he produced perhaps, as you've said, one of the best sequels ever made. You know, it was darker than the original, but that was a bonus as well. Um, it was bigger budget. It had more locations if you said better special effects better music everything about it and and that on its own completely changed the whole sort of mindset of hollywood and from that moment on everything that we now take for granted like the marvel expanded universe and the, the dc comics expanded universe and these these films that form part of greater narratives you can trace it all back to Empire Strikes Back. And, you know, we always say on the show that we pe we owe this massive debt to the people back in time that invented application forms and invented technology. We actually owe a massive debt to George Lucas for getting Empire to screen because it absolutely changed the way that sequels were made and it started this whole wider sort of narrative thing that we now take for granted. 
Absolutely. And um, what is fascinating is you could, and time is against it to do it, you could try and um, play the, the contrast game between what they could do and the marketing uh, kind of initiative of the 1977 original yeah. and what was possible in, in 1980, which is not, you know, not many years later. What I think is still very important to note is that this remained an independent production. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. back to, you know, the, the, the misgivings of the, of the finances and producers, George Lucas went, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and finance this myself yes, and yes. you guys will come around. And, and, so, and, and so they did. Okay, let's move on then to, to the marketing element. And actually, let's talk about this trailer, which was shown in the autumn winter of 1979. Yeah. Now, when I rewatched this trailer, I couldn't believe it. Um, I mean... Yes, I, I was intrigued again by some of the deleted scenes, which are quite interesting, you know, Luke moving in for a kiss on Leia. But what shocked me was this really cheesy, diabolical voiceover that apparently Harrison Ford did for it. And it just sounded so sort of uh, just wrong. Um, and I'm just thinking, how, why did they do that? It just seemed to me to cheapen the whole deal and i can almost imagine them having to force harrison ford to do it and he <laughs> sat there in front of the microphone just rolling his eyes thinking oh please don't make me read out this script but you I like think, it though don't you? <laughs> i think it's brilliant i think it's exactly the way it should be now let me let me give you uh, a reason as to why and you must feel free to disagree Let's cast our mind back to you know the origin of Star Wars and and what was driving George Lucas was to reconnect and almost show to a younger audience mm -hmm. his youth around TV series and radio series and I think that the um, the brief to to Harrison Ford is can you find a way to almost take us back to the fifties and the sixties where someone who's who's listening to you know, the Marlowe detective series or, or Buck Rogers or, or Flash Gordon, as we know, was a big, big inspiration where the voice is recounting what has happened. And now we're back into episode number 77 or whatever, you know, they, they were listening to. So I think there was an the element of nostalgia to reconnect that, but also very cleverly, you could actually listen, hear this on radio. So for me, there was a dual purpose, which was this could be the trailer. And you're right, there are so many deleted scenes. I mean, like Star Wars nerds and historians like you and I and Mark Asquith and and, and Gary will, will be all over it because there's ever a scene of um, C-3PO who is playing a trick on the uh, Stormtroopers and I kind of think she never made it to the final version. So for me, it was almost taking us back to that era that George Lucas is so fond of, and including his friend Steven Spielberg, and also means that this would play superbly uh, on radio. I'm told through, you know, obviously, research and trivia that there is even a version that actually George Lucas didn't go ahead where, where Harrison Ford sounds even more hysterical, <laughs> and they didn't go for that one. They went for the one that we heard a moment ago. Okay, I'll give you that. I have to say, yeah, <laughs> thinking about it. No, that it works, actually, if you think about it, because I know that... George Lucas was very much influenced by those 1930s, 1940s cinema serials like Flash Gordon, the original Flash Gordon, and Buck Rogers in the 25th century. And yes, their their trailers had that voiceover. It was very animated. It was a little bit cheesy. And I can see how that actually fits in with what Lucas was trying to to go for. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no problem at all. Now, the, the trailer and the audio uh, ends with the breathing of uh, Darth Vader, which actually has been used in then much, much later movie productions, even TV series, like the sign that, you know, of the biggest villain ever mm. um, going on to, to the big screen, which led them to go ahead in the autumn uh, winter of 79 with a teaser poster which again i don't think i don't think it was done a lot there was a poster and that was your lot and here there was a teaser poster of you know the the whole kind of helmet and and kind of upper part of darth vader the star wars saga continues then you have that kind of title which in, the, in this very unique calligraphy you had the the billing and coming to your galaxy this summer yeah i mean and and, and let's face it there were people who thought darth vader was 
was dead because at the end of Star Wars, you know, his, his <laughs> yes. TIE fighters spiraling away. I think it actually did correct itself and then fly away. But a lot of people thought that he was dead. I mean, the main poster, uh, again, beautiful piece of artwork. Mm. Um, I love the original poster. You've got you've got Darth Vader again there, but you've then you've got that controversial sort of um, almost like. Uh, cinematic swoon where uh, Harrison Ford is leaning over about to kiss Princess Leia and again I'm thinking no 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 that's not some, that's not meant to happen but what I didn't know Pascal is that they did another poster later because people were complaining that Lando Calrissian wasn't in the original poster yeah well the thing is uh, back to 79 or 78 when they filmed 79 and 80 um, Lando was a, a supporting uh, character, very much like Boba Fett. You know, you, mm. you could argue. So, for the filmmakers, um, they didn't really uh, appreciate, and even would have guessed that people would have loved the character. I mean, I, I thought you know it was an important character. So, I would agree that um, if you want to have the, the poster on your bedroom wall, as I did, you want this poster to capture you know all the different elements of the movie, and the character of Lando is so so important to the point where he's obviously made a few appearances yeah absolutely now one of the things that really struck me about the marketing for empire strikes <laughs> back was of course the merchandising now when star wars was launched into in 1977 they didn't really they didn't really realize how big the merchandising could be and a lot of the merchandise actually didn't make it out into the market until after Christmas of 1977 so they sort of missed the boat didn't they with getting all the toys out for the original Star Wars film so they made sure that they didn't miss the boat for Empire Strikes Back I mean everything was out there bef well before the film and in fact they actually blew quite a few spoilers didn't they by getting some of the toys out so the At At Walker toys were out in the market before the film came out so you know that reveal of the At At Walkers and how they looked was ruined for some people because the toys were already available uh, but they absolutely went all in didn't they because the studio really for the original star wars apart from the trailer apart from the posters they didn't really do much now the marketing p team for the original star wars made sure they had a few tie-ins with marvel comics who did a, an adaptation of the film but beyond comic-con and that sort of thing the marketing for star wars was pretty low-key it was all word of mouth but they went absolutely all in with star wars didn't they all the usual trailers posters press interviews production casting international premiere spoilers and absolute avalanche of <laughs> of tie-in toys pinball machines you know models uh action figures uh, clothed absolutely everything you could think of it was an absolute empire strikes back mania as far as toys and, and merchandise was concerned yeah and you're right to to remind all of us you know the sequence of events so with the 1977 77 classic the merchandising came after uh, even in some cases where people would buy the empty box or the voucher waiting for the the item to be produced this came uh, before mm -hmm. um, um my dad had a friend who had the empire strikes back pinball machine in his garage <laughs> he bought it um, at an auction and it was like the full thing. So in a way, I remember playing the pinball machine before seeing the game and therefore that the, the if people know about pinball machine, I'm a huge fan. There is actually uh, almost like a sequence you have to respect to get all the all the major points. So I was playing out the story on this pinball machine without having a clue what was going on until I saw the film. I realized, oh right, that's why I had to do this. The one thing that I will say about the um, merchandising, the the one thing that, to, to my knowledge, they didn't go ahead with as a spoiler is Yoda until much much later. Yeah, and interesting about spoilers and rumors and this that and the other is one thing which i thought was an absolute genius idea and i've only recently become aware of this now obviously there was a three-year gap between star wars and empire strikes back and they had to keep everybody on their toes didn't they and keep the anticipation 
building for Empire. And there was an article published in Starburst magazine, which actually included a load of rumours about what was going to be in the film. And that they came up with about 20 different rumours. And they knew that some of these rumours were totally and utterly made up. But they did it deliberately. But they also included things in that list which were actually true. So I'll, I'll just read a couple of them out for you. So they talked about Han being frozen in carbonite, which did happen. They talked about Lando Calrissian, which did happen. They talk about Boba Fett, who'd have previously appeared in a, in a comic, actually. He, he's, but they also talked about Luke actually did hook up with Leia. Wow. They also <laughs> did talk about Luke killing Han Solo. That was one of the rumors. They also talked about the Millennium Falcon getting zapped into a time warp and going back to the days of the Clone Wars, where they would then fight alongside Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke's father, who at that point we didn't know was Anakin Skywalker, etc., etc. And one of the rumors, including in that list, was that Vader was Luke's father. But... It was like, it was the big reveal hidden in plain sight, but they were so clever. They sort of wrapped it around some truths and some untruths. And nobody really, nobody really took any notice of it because, well, that's absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> it's as ridiculous as Luke killing Han. And there it was, Pascal, before we even went to the very, cinema. It was out there. That, very, is, that is very clever. Very clever. Because Danny, in 1979-80, we're into the realm of fanzines. So, mm -hmm. you know, people, there was no internet to speak of at all. So, you know, these were being people, people like you and I, maybe using maybe the one computer in the IT room of the college, typing very badly the news about the Empire Strikes Back and sharing all those um, false rumors. But to have actually the real, uh, you know, I, movie reveals in, it's wrapped around fake ones, this is quite, quite genius. Going back to 1980 and, and, essentially print TV and radio, one thing that they used. So, you know, in 2022, your, your think would be very much geared towards social media because that's what people yeah. have access to. But in, in, in the late 70s and 80s, you and I can remember, you know, the way in which um, the home phone was actually an important item. I mean, I remember running very, very expensive bills for my poor parents who you know, I had to work and clean the car many times to pay off, you know, the bills <laughs> I'd be running for them because I would do things like, for example, Lucasfilm has set up a, a, a hotline number yeah. where yeah. you could ring to hear a message from the cast members but that was like a, a premium number. <laughs> yeah, it probably yeah. helped pay for the, some of the marketing. Yeah, and uh, well, I, I remember phoning that number myself, so I think I must have run up a, a pretty big bill as well. And and talking about the actual launch of the film in uh, in 1980, um, one thing that I didn't know again was that Fox demanded that they that the cinemas actually had the film running for 28 weeks whereas normally it was 12, so that was a revelation. And I think I did know this, but the actual original premiere of the film took place in London, as opposed to America, which is what you would have expected. Because in those days, remember, Pascal, normally films would be launched, launched in America, and in the UK we might actually have, have had to have waited like six months before we get them in the UK. Whereas, of course, these days it's pretty much usually on the same day or within days, isn't it? But, yeah, the, the premiere was uh, in London. But I guess if you think about it, a lot of Star Wars was filmed at Elstree, I think. Was it Elstree? That's right, yeah. yeah. It so, is, yes. So mm -hmm. there, there they are. I think that's that feels good, you know. This not to the hard work of of the the UK, you know, um, crew in particular, and saying Let, let's do one. But I think in terms of the the premiere, from a marketing point of view, it, it was a bit complicated and convoluted because actually, back to you know this comment about CBS and their first color TV programs, what they wanted to do here is obviously give people an experience. So actually, the first prints of the Empire Strikes Back were in 70 millimeters uh, uh. and not many cinemas had the right projectors. They had to wait a few weeks before they went back down to the normal standard 35 mil. So I think there may be some element of that, but yeah, you're right. You know, um, the first, first real premiere was um, in, in London and then people you know, had to wait for their own premieres around the world. But in terms of the PR and marketing, I mean, the, the, the cast in particular and, and the producer 
services went around pretty much all major cities globally. That was like a world trip. And if you take the trouble to watch on replay some of the Star Wars celebration, the interviews of Mark Hamill, you'll say, you know, sometimes he didn't know where he was, literally which country he was until he heard somebody <laughs> speak. Absolutely right. Now, Pascal, we could carry on talking about the marketing for Empire Strikes Back for another couple of days because obviously it's 40 years since the original film came out. And since then, there have been special editions, there have been VHS versions, there have been DVD versions, there have been Blu ray versions, um, box sets, you name it, there's been a different version of it. But the only piece of marketing that has been done since that I wanted to just highlight purely from the point of view of the fact that it's absolutely gorgeous is the 40th anniversary poster, which probably got lost a bit in 20, um, 20, in 2020 because of the pandemic. But the 40th anniversary poster is absolutely gorgeous. It really just features Darth Vader and Luke, and there's a lot of tech. There's TIE Fighters, at at Walkers, Star Destroyers, etc. And it's very symmetrical, and it's very mm. grey and black, but I think it's absolutely gorgeous. So I thought I would give that one a shout-out amongst the millions of other things that we could have talked about that have happened with uh, Marketing Empire since it was originally launched. Yeah, I, and I just close on that. I have to agree. You know, the um, that poster it only actually makes me feel very sad that because of the pandemic, we didn't have as fans and as filmmakers, we didn't have the fortieth anniversary. Maybe there'd be something for the for the forty fifth, and maybe <laughs> we should find a way to get involved. You and I. Yeah. Um, what I will say, taking us back to the nineteen eighties, and in terms of the success, but also the the, the different different times, Empire Strikes Back used to come back on the big screen regularly. So nowadays, a film is is released, goes onto the big screen once, then goes into streaming. And really, you have to be an enlightened you know, cinema owner to do uh, rescreening because of anniversary and so on. And you and I were able to go to the movies regularly to watch again Star Wars and Empire for, for decades. You know, It was a normal thing to do. And I wonder whether we should sometime go back to this habit of showing a movie again because, of course, it has to be enjoyed on the big screen. I would absolutely agree with that, Pascal. <laughs> Listen, this is, has been an absolute pleasure. Episode 8080 my dear friend thank you everyone for your amazing support don't forget to leave comments and suggestions online and also through speakpipe.com forward slash two gigs and a marketing podcast thank you so much until the next one go out there and be sure that your marketing is done right i was pascal Pantoni and he was roger edwards mm-hmm.